not just for the nation of ancient Israel, but Father, remind us that like the people of Malachi's day, we often come to you and offer you uh, worship that's half-hearted. We are often insincere. And Father, we sometimes sleep, walk through the motions, and go through the motions of a worship service. Father, help us to be genuine, authentic when we come before you. And lastly, Father, as we open the words from Malachi tonight, we ask that you would have us to see and perceive the truth. For it's in Christ that we pray. And everyone says... From Malachi tonight, chapter number three, we'll be reading verses six and following. This is part six through Malachi. It's only four chapters. It's a small prophet. And I said that I would take this in manageable chunks and I would kind of capture ideas. Uh, so rather than go through the entire chapter, I don't want to do that because it rushes it. Or, and that's, I don't want to go word by word because you want to kind of capture each thought that Malachi has. And that's what I'm trying to do in this series of this prophet. Uh, we've gone through Habakkuk before and Malachi tonight. So again, remind you guys, if you put this on a timeline, I don't have a timeline for you tonight. He's the last prophet in the Old Covenant period before the 400 years of silence happens. He has been in the land with the other Israelites for about 100 years uh, since the captivity of Babylon. The, the king of Persia let them come back in the land. They rebuilt the temple. They're rebuilding the walls. And now uh, they're starting to offer you know, religious sacrifices again. So God comes to Malachi. And they've been in the land about 100 years with the... And he, and it comes with some complaints. So the book of Malachi consists of a series of accusations between Yahweh and the various groups of Israelites within the, within the Israelite community. So it comes with complaints about different people in the, in the community. So we've spent some time looking at these complaints so far. The first complaint, series of complaints, were against the, the priests. And God's complaints against the priests were they had offered lame sacrifices. They were, uh, they were exploiting the poor. They were taking advantage of their positions as priests. And then God turns attention to the tribe of Judah specifically and how they were mar marrying foreign women, bringing them in and bringing idolatry into the land. And then we exhausted that. And Malachi offers a, a promise that... Someone from the tribe of Judah would come and offer a sacrifice, which would, which would please God. Of course, we know who that person was from the tribe of Judah, who would offer a sacrifice. He offered himself a sacrifice, pleasing to God, and of course, is Jesus. So let's begin tonight in verse number 6. Uh, God continues speaking. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return to you? Let's begin by, asking the, by looking at the statement here and thinking about it for a second here. I, the Lord, do not change. Of all the doctrines that relate to God, this relates to the immutability of God. The immutability of God is a doctrine that states that God does not change His essential attributes. Whatever makes God God, He cannot change that. So what, what are essential attributes? It's those things that which God possesses that make him God. For example, God is eternal. God can't stop being eternal. And if he stopped being eternal, he would stop being God. Uh, God is uh, omniscient. He knows everything. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. You take those attributes away from God, those are essential features, essential attributes, he stops being God. Now what's being taught here by the immutability of God is that God cannot change who he is. Now you're thinking, because you're a bunch of smart theologians, how about in the Incarnation? God became man. Did he not change who he was? No, he did not. This is where we have to be very careful to split this hair pretty fine. He does not change who he is in essence, but he adds to his divinity humanity. He does not change his divine nature. He doesn't stop being God in the Incarnation. Christ was God before he was man. He was God while he was man. He was God, is God now from the Ascension onward. Christ is eternally the God. He didn't stop being God during the Incarnation. You thought of something else? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. If he's God, how come he can't change himself? That's where that's something he cannot do as God. That's right. That's certainly, that's right. So there are things God cannot do logically. He can't make a square circle. He can't make a rock so big he can't lift it. He can't make a one-ended stick. God can't do certain things, right? God can't defy what is reasonable, right? God doesn't sin also. So notice this here. When we say God's immutable, we mean not just that he doesn't change, but he cannot change. Yeah, well, he's bound by his own nature. He's bound by certain things for sure. Well, to the, to the benefits of the people of Jacob, that's a good thing that he doesn't change. And I'll show you why here. It says, I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. 
Now, we ask ourselves again and again, look at the Old Testament stories, why didn't God just wipe them off the map? I mean, he threatened once during the time of Moses to wipe them off. He said, Moses, I'll t I can wipe the people of Israel out. And Moses intercedes, please don't. If, if you kill them all, God, then the people of Egypt and the surrounding countries will think that you're, you don't keep your promises. Remember that story? Well, God could have wiped out the Israelites and began again with Moses, couldn't he? I suppose in theory he could have done that. Began the nation again with one man. He certainly could have done that. But when you look at all the times that Israel failed God and they, they broke his laws and commands again and again, just as we do, we ask ourselves, why didn't God wipe them off the face of the map? Why didn't God send out a fireball to consume them in the desert when they grumbled and complained? Why didn't God, when they were building idols in the promised land, not send armies to wipe them out entirely? Why did God spare them? Was it because they were faithful? No, they were very unfaithful. They never were faithful to God, at least not for very long it's because God was faithful. It's because God was faithful. I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, therefore, you, O children of Jacob, you're not consumed. You ought to be glad I'm God. You better be glad that not only do I not change, but I'm faithful and merciful and long-suffering to you. I'm a God who could wipe you out, but chose not to. But the real re so God was merciful to these people when they sinned. But we know the infant. We know the point of history up to the time of Christ, why God was keeping that promise. God spared the ethnic, the ethnic nation of Israel because he made a promise, an unconditional promise to Abraham. I'll say that one more time. God spared the ethnic nation of Israel because he made an unconditional promise to Abraham. He said, Abraham, because you've been faithful from your descendants, I'll make as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sand on the beaches. Abraham, I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to keep my promise to you. And so even though Abraham's descendants were unfaithful, God was going to keep a remnant of believers and was a spare a nation so that from that nation he could bring about his son, the incarnation, the incarnation to save the world. See, God kept his promise because that's who God is. God doesn't lie. How often do you make a promise to someone and break it? Let's have lunch sometime, or I'll see you tomorrow, or sure you can do that. And we break those promises, sometimes intentionally. Sometimes we intend to break the promises. Sometimes we don't intend to, right? That's what the Bible says. Let your yes be yes, your no be no, and keep your answers limited, right? But sometimes we make a promise that we don't follow through with. God never does that. God never makes a promise to follow through with. If God said he'll do it, it's as sure as the sun coming up tomorrow. More sure than that, isn't it? So God says... Jacob, you're not consumed by, by my wrath, and you've got to be thankful because I don't change. I'm, I'm keeping a promise I made to Abraham. Sure, I'm long-suffering and merciful, and sure, I, I've been faithful to you, but I'm really faithful because of the promise I made to Abraham, not necessarily because you've been faithful. Does that make some sense to us? Listen to God's indictment. So let's move on now to the indictment he gives this nation. He says, from the days of your fathers, talking about even the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, from the days of your fathers, you've turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Israel, I'll say this here, Israel had been in perpetual disobedience since day one. Even before day one. Remember when Moses brought them out of the wilderness? You know the story. And they got to the Sinai within the first 30 days or so. And they finally got to Sinai and Moses went up on the mountain to meet with God. And what were the children of Israel doing in the foot of the mountain when Moses was gone for several weeks? Yeah, they, they, they took their nose rings out, their earrings out, and they melted them down, they smelted them, and they, and they molded it into a golden calf and began to worship that. Moses on the mountain talking to God, communing with him, getting the law of the Ten Commandments. And the first was, you should have no gods before me, right? And what are they doing down at the foot of the mountain but putting a God before God, aren't they? They're committing idolatry here. God was faithful to give them the law even when they were unfaithful to him. This is the good news, I think, that we're getting at here, is that restoration of a sinner... Is, is close as repentance. That no matter how far you stray away from God, you're never so far that a single footstep won't take you back to Him. Return to me, God said, and I'll return to you. Repent, that's what repentance is, turning around. Repentance is 180 degrees. It's going this direction and turning to go this direction. Repentance is that. And God says, no matter how far you walk from me, if you just turn with your hearts back to me, it's I'll make the distance up. That's pretty cool, isn't it? No matter how far you stray from God, one turning around, God makes a difference. Return to me, God says, and I will return to you. I'll go the distance. The people of Israel, though, were, were lost, uh, and they were unbelieving at, at times for sure. And they didn't recognize how wrong they were at times. Look at Malachi 3, 8 through 9. 
me give you an example here where God shows, they ask, how, God, have we wronged you? How, what have we done wrong to you? They anticipate, God anticipates the question. Here's how they wronged God. Verse 8, will man rob God? Yet you're robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? And God's answers are, in your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Now, the Israelites are not guilty of committing armed robbery. They didn't meet God in some back alley and stick a knife in his back and say, give me your wallet. They weren't embezzling money from some sort of 501c3 organization they set up to launder money. You know how they're robbing God, but not giving God what he required of them. God said, you didn't give me two things you should have given me. The first was the tithe, and the second was the contribution. Now, there really are two separate things. There are two separate things here. First of all, let's let's discuss tonight what the tithe is. Under the Old Covenant, and I'll show you from the text, the tithe is a food offering. It's a food offering. It's 10% of your household foods. Look in Deuteronomy chapter 26, verse 12. In the law, God says, when you finish paying all the tithe of your produce, that's food, vegetables, in the third year, which is the year of tithing, giving to the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, so they may eat within your towns and be filled. Now, a tithe was a food offering under the Old Covenant. And if you qualified, I mean, if you were a Levite, you qualified because they, they didn't have land in the promised land. They lived being supported by the other, other 11 tribes. Or if you were a sojourner, a traveler, or if you're a widow or an orphan, you could qualify for benevolence ministries. You could qualify for food in the land. And it was all kept by the, by the priest, wasn't it? But a tithe under the law was a 10% uh, amount based upon your food, food storages. Now, we as a church, listen carefully because we, we get this wrong all the time. We don't take up tithes in a church. We're not under the Old Testament law. We don't, we don't, we don't have grain silos in the back of the church. And we don't ask, bring your 10% of your food into the church next week. We don't, care, we don't take up food offerings. We're not under the Old Testament law of Deuteronomy 26, 12. We don't tithe in that sense. If, in fact, if you look at your bulletins, I did something clever about seven years ago. I took out the word tithe from the bulletin. I just put offering in there because that's a New Testament concept. Now you say, well, what if I decide to give 10%? Sure, give 15%, give, fi- give 100% of whatever you earn. But unless we put grain silos in the back or food pantries, we're not taking up tithes in the sense of the old covenant law. We're not taking up food offerings, sorry. Now we have in the past taken up donations for food for, for Thanksgiving baskets, but that's not a tithe in the biblical sense here. The tithe was used under the Old Testament to support the tribe of Levi primarily, but also for widows, orphans, and those who had food shortages. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Now, am I saying that as New Testament Christians, we shouldn't be doing benevolence work? Not at all. In fact, it's our obligation to help those in the church and outside the church, in our communities and around the world. For sure it is. In fact, the benevolence ministers of the church should be carrying on. I'll show an example of this. The Apostle James in James 1, 26 through 27 said this. We're to care for widows and orphans. Uh, James said this. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. It means if you can't keep your mouth shut and bite your tongue, if you're slandering and lying and cursing, you probably ought to check your heart, right? But here's the next one. Here's true religion. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the acts of religious duties, is this, here's the things, visit orphans and widows in their affliction and keep oneself unstained from the world. Now, who is James? Who gave him the authority to say this? Of course, James is an apostle. He's the half-brother of Jesus. And in fact, he doesn't become a believer in Christ after the resurrection. Can you imagine that? We find him twice in the gospel as he comes to get Jesus, Jesus with his mother Mary to say, big brother, you've lost your mind. You stopped eating. You're saying these radical, wild things about yourself. They try to drag him out of the house. James, with his other brothers, comes with Mary to get Jesus to come back home with them. He doesn't believe who Christ is till after the resurrection. And then he doesn't just become a Christian. He becomes the head of the church in Jerusalem. And in fact, in the, in the earliest days of the church, the head of the church was in Jerusalem. And that was going to be true to about 70 AD when the city was kind of leveled. And of course, Antioch becomes the, head of the place of the head of the church, and so does Alexandria. Other parts of the world become big centrals of Christian population at that point. But James says this in his epistle, If you say you love God, but ignore those who have needs, you ought to check your heart. 
If someone comes to you and it's cold and you say, be warm, brother, and have a good night, but don't give them a coat, you're not a Christian. James would say those kinds of things. And here James says, it's a duty as a Christian to look after the widows, orphans, and those in affliction. It's true, isn't it? I think the church ought to be ahead of benevolence ministries. And I think, this is my soapbox here, if the church did the church's job, we wouldn't need welfare as a, as a nation. The church would be doing its job. You guys agree? We wouldn't need food stamps if the church would just, in its community, take care of every person's community. You could limit the size and scope of government overnight if the church just became the church in its communities. You don't have to say amen to that. You can say, oh, me. <laughs> but somewhere we dropped the ball and said, it's not the church's job. Let's let somebody else handle this. But James would say it is a job of the church to take care of first those in the church and then those in the communities. In fact, I'll give you an example of this. One of Paul's very first missionary journeys, you read in the book of Acts, one of his first missionary journeys involved going around to the churches he planted on his way back through and t- picking up donations for the church back in Jerusalem because there was a great famine in the land. And who was the head of the church in Jerusalem? James. I think it's not ironic that James would say years later, if you don't take care of those who are hungry, you're not a Christian. And James is the sole beneficiary of the mission trip of Paul, right? James and the church of Jerusalem got fed because Paul brought donations back to Jerusalem. That's why James, I think, was so convicted about saying you ought to help those in need because he benefited from that. I think James was saying, look, as a Christian, you ought to be able to do this. In fact, Paul writes about this several times in his epistles. And I'll I'll show you two examples where Paul talks about this benevolence ministry. Look at 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 4. This collection of the saints... A collection for the saints refers to gathering up food and money donations to take back to the church in Jerusalem. That's what he's talking about here in 1 Corinthians 16. Paul says this, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, that's the churches he planted in Galatia, he's now talking to the church of Corinth, and so also are, you also ought to do, verse 2, on the first day of every week, that's when they had their gatherings for church services, and on a Sunday, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may pos- prosper. So whatever you have stored up, whatever you can afford to give, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. So Paul's saying, he's writing to the church at Corinth, I'm going to come back into the town between now, every Sunday when you get together to worship, in the next five or six weeks, when I get there, have a, an offering gathered so I can take it back to Jerusalem because they're hurting down there. They're starving. You know, we, uh, we as Christians give to the cooperative program. And part of the monies we do supports missions in our own backyard, but some of it helps people around the world, doesn't it? And some of it, if you give to groups like the Samaritan's Purse, helps to feed and shelter people who've gone through disasters, right? Disaster relief uh, monies. So Paul was saying to the church of Corinth, we've got to help our sister church in Jerusalem. Now, you'll be hard-pressed to find anywhere in the New Testament a percentage amount you're supposed to give. Right? You will not find a minimal 10% anywhere listed in the New Testament pages. Under the law, yes, there was a tithe. 10% of your grain goods, you take it to the priests. Paul didn't say it here. He says, as you've prospered, you give. Give in the way that you can afford to give, right? Some people give a lot, some can't give much, but Paul said, whatever you feel led to give. In fact, here is the only qualification which Christians are to meet when we give. Give cheerfully. Don't give begrudgingly. Give with a joyful heart. Now, that might be 5%, and it might be 85%. It depends upon who the person is, what their heart is like, and how much they can afford to give, isn't it? That is, that is the standard by which you give, is which you feel convicted to give, the percentage based upon you feel able to give. Now, I'm afraid most folks can't afford to give, and many folks don't want to give, but the point is, we should be giving whatever we can give. I'll give you an example. 2 Corinthians after 8. Paul writes a second time to church of Corinth about the same issue. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, this is the second letter to the church of Corinth. Paul says, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their, and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord. 
begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. That's again, the relief aid in Jerusalem. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. And that's pretty cool. Paul said those churches in Macedonia, that's in ancient Greece, Philippi in that area, they gave more than expected. They gave in extreme poverty. They outgave you guys in, in the Carathon last, last month because they gave uh, first themselves to God, then their, then their material possessions to us later. You know, Bra Paul bragged about the churches of Macedonia because they gave out of the abundance of their heart first. They were generous in love and it manifested in their giving. You see, I'll put, this, I'll put it on the screen here. God doesn't want 10% of your income after taxes. He wants 100% of you. Let me, let me say that because it's tax time. God doesn't want 10% of your income after taxes. He wants 100% of you because if God gets 100% of you, he gets everything else, doesn't he? If you give yourself to God, if he has all of you, he doesn't require 10%. You will give what you feel led to give. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. So the people of, the, of Malachi's day were supposed to keep the food pantries going in the temple to keep the priests fed and the widows and orphans fed, and they were not giving what they should be giving. And as a result, those who were most unfortunate were suffering. Right, The priests got their cut, but unfortunately, the widows and orphans were left out. They were the ones on the bottom of the totem pole. They were the ones starving at most, like it always happens. Well, here's a solution for lack of trusting. Here's a solution for their stinginess. It's, it's what God requires they give. Verse 10. Bring the full tithe, that's a 10%, into the storehouse. That's the food storage, right? There may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you the blessing until there is no more need. Verse 11. I will rebuke the devourer for you. So it may not destroy the fruits of your soil. That's any kind of pestilence, right? And the vine of the field shall not, be, shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for you'll be a honor, a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Again, i got to stress this one more time. What The tie that he's talking about here is the food for the benevolence ministry for the priests and the widows and orphans. And, and again here, Malachi says, if you will give obediently, faithfully, It'll be a testimony to the world. What would it say about our church if we had a lot of material needs in the church and had money in the bank and didn't meet the, the needs of our church members? If we had folks show up at the church that were starving and we had money in the bank at the church, that would speak low of this church, wouldn't it? If we had a, a big poly fund and then kids across the street not wearing shoes we knew about, that would say a lot of our church, wouldn't it? It'd say how little we think of those in our community, how little we think of those who have true needs. You know, I've seen many televangelists use this text to say, you know, if you give them a ministry, God's promise you in Malachi is going to bless you tenfold. This text don't teach that. It's a promise under the old covenant, the people in Malachi's day, if you faithfully give the storehouse and support the, the widows, orphans, and the priests, it'll be a testimony to the nations that God will bless you back in other ways. Let me say this, and I'll put it on the screen. If you give to the church offering to get a return on your investment, you forfeit your spiritual blessings. One thing I'll never preach because it's not biblical is I will not say sow a seed into this church. <laughs> Have a need, sow a seed. What it sounds to me is I've got greed, sow a seed. That's what it sounds like to me when people say sow a seed. The Bible does not promise you uh, that if you give money to the church that God's going to give you back 100% on your return. If you want to sow a seed, plant a garden. Here's what most folks in the church do. They think, if I give a lot to the church, I'll have more say in what happens. I'll have more power in the church. And I've seen this in many churches. And I don't know who the big givers are. And I don't care who the big giver. Paula knows, probably, as the church treasurer. But that should have no influence over who has any authority in the church, how much you give to the church that has no authority. Because once you give to the church, it's not yours anymore. It's God's money. As a church, we can decide where it goes. Right? But it's not yours to say, I gave $1,000 a plate last Sunday. I think $500 ought to go here. No, once you put it in the plate, that's where it is, right? Now, if you designate a certain amount to go to this because we have an offering, that's perfectly fine. But people give sometimes just to get the authority to have power in the church. And that's not the intent of it. Say, oh, me or amen. I don't care. <laughs> but, but, 
But God told this nation of people, if you want to get back in the old covenant, old covenant, this is the first thing we evidence by this is how generous you are. And if you keep my commands, a very simple command is go home and count your food in your pantries and give a tenth of this to the priests. Now, the New Testament does talk about the tithe. Christ does mention the tithe. When he scolds the Pharisees, he says to the Pharisees, he says, you, you Pharisees, you dirty, rotten vipers, you will tithe a 10% of the spice in your pantry at home. But your heart's far from me. You'll be so sure to go home and pour out the spice and cut it up and give God 10% of whatever spices you have in your cabin at home to fulfill the tithe law. But you don't know God, the God you pretend to worship. You're faithful in the outward things. But here in Malachi's day, God says, if you only give proof that you've turned back to me, you're, you'll fill the storehouse up again. That's the first evidence you've turned back to God. You should start to do things for God. And that's, that's what God is saying in Malachi's day. Look in verse 13. And I love this. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, how have we spoken against you? And here's how God says they've spoken against God. You have said, it is vain to serve God. It's meaningless to serve God. It's empty to serve God. What is profit of our keeping his charge or walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? Why should we keep God's command? It makes us unhappy, right? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. God is saying, you speak against me when you say, what good is there in serving God? Many folks think that way. What good is there in serving God? There's no benefit for me down here. Well, I was pretty today. I could have been out doing something else besides me. I could have done other things today. It was beautiful outside. What's the, what's the benefit in serving God? God said, you're speaking against me when you don't serve me. I tell you this, God didn't promise you a private jet if you come to church. He didn't promise you a tropical island resort vacation. He doesn't promise you some return on your investment if you put money in the offering plate. <clears throat> but if you give your heart to Christ, you know what he promises you? He promises you your home in heaven. That's what he promises you. In fact, I close with these verses, Matthew 6, 19, the Beatitudes. This is in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where, where thieves break in and steal. But, he said, not that we Christians don't have treasure. Here's where our treasure is. But, here's the conjunction, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where neither thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You can know a lot about a man by his checkbook, can't you? I think the, the, the most notable autobiography we ever write is our checkbook because it tells where our priorities were in the life that we lived down here. Let's pray. Father, come before you at this time and we look at the